No, I mean, I don't find it remarkable, but I didn't expect anything other than that. We, I think we run a pretty good shop over here. Yeah. Um, as I noted earlier, we were recognized less than a month ago for an award of excellence as a government agency. I think that's pretty good evidence that people on the outside do see us as running a good shop. And uh, as I think I also told him that the purpose of the report was to um, look for where we could improve. And uh, I've never in my life contended that I was Jesus Christ. So <laughs> other than him, I don't know who's perfect. The, the audit sort of implied in a couple of situations that defendants might not have been given the most fair situations or might have been treated, I don't want to say totally unfairly, but particularly it pointed out that, you know, in some cases they meet their defense counsel immediately before the hearing and, and it implied that that might kind of undermine the ability for the defense counsel to do its job properly. Uh, in another section it talked about whether Just or not... Just one at a time. Well, what do you want to do? So That's what's your response to that particular... Um, I don't do the court-appointed docket. Judge Schwartz does that, but I, I do monitor it and I read the report. Um, I read what his comments were. Um, I, I, there's a reason we do it the way we do it, and I think it's a very valid and appropriate reason. And having read his report, having watched the court in operation in that regard, I wouldn't make a change. Um, and, and I, part of my problem with, with the auditor is that he was not an attorney or a judge. He was a former police officer, and I think some of the nuances of court that might have escaped him. Having read that passage in the preliminary draft, I did my own little experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I took, after the docket was over, after the court appointed docket was over, I took the actual cases that were on the docket and I evaluated what had happened. The there's a lot of implications, part of the problem I have is there's a lot of implications in here, but he doesn't come right out and make a conclusion. So one is left to try to interpret what was the point. And I think this is, you, you just yeah. observed yourself, it's sort of implied, but nothing is said. The implications seem to be that people weren't getting fair treatment. Uh, they were being bullied, if you will, into a, into a plea. We had on this particular docket 48 uh, people. Out of the 48, only 28 appeared. I'll get back to that point. Of the 28 that appeared, two applied for diversion, 13 had their case continued for further review, seven people pled, five people pled not guilty and set the matter for trial. What those percentages tell us is that of the 28 that showed up, only 7% felt ready to enter a plea and did so. Uh, that's not unusual. It's not unusual for anybody to enter a plea when they have a charge of uh, driving while suspended and they know their license is suspended and the uh, prosecutor is willing to give them the minimum sentence. It's a pretty simple case. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a lengthy conversation with your attorney to decide what you want to do. Nonetheless, only 25% only of the people even did that. About half of them, 13, uh, did want uh, more review with their attorney, and they continued the case for that very reason. And, and that was that is freely done. If you if you're not comfortable uh, when you show up that time, and it's not their first time in court; it's actually at least their second time in court, uh, because the first time is when they get an attorney appointed for them. Mm, true. That's when they meet their attorney. They are given plenty of opportunity, I believe, plenty of opportunity to discuss their case with their attorney and decide what step they want to take next. Five people felt strongly enough about the charges against them that they wanted to have a trial. And I don't know what, that's about 20% of those that showed, set the matter for trial. Mm -hmm. These guys, and I've worked with them since I got here, uh, they've been court-appointed counsel. This firm has been the court-appointed counsel uh, long before I ever arrived. 2003, I think, maybe? Or? Uh, that's, that's what he mentioned to me this morning. I couldn't have told you. He just told me that. I think yeah. he told you that. I know they've been, I got here in 2011. We've mm -hmm. renewed their contract twice since that time. Uh, we've done it each of those two times under a bid process. The first time, nobody else bid on the, on the uh, project. 
the second time there were only two uh, bidders and they were one of them. Uh, but I'm comfortable that they provide zealous representation for their clients. Uh, and that's what I want from court-appointed attorneys. Uh, I want them to make sure, I want them to be sure that their clients are getting the same quality of representation they would if they had retained an attorney. I, I, can, I can confidently say they get probably better representation than a lot of people who have retained attorneys. I'm comfortable with this firm. So, uh, kind of on the flip side of that a little bit, um, and kind of contradictory to what some people have criticized the court for, you know, in the past we've heard criticism, and in the past I mean very recently, that the court is operating as a revenue generator, a debtor's court, and the audit said uh, at one point that the court could be a little bit more aggressive in the way that it gets and obtains its fees in collecting those fees. Yeah, I found that odd. Did you find that odd? <laughs> I, so I wanted to see, you know, what was your reaction to that? Uh, you know, in terms of being more aggressive, can it be more aggressive or...? Uh, no, we have to be very careful. Uh, well, I, actually, I kind of laughed at that one uh, because he implied that if... Uh, that I could get more money out of people than what they told me they were going to pay. And I don't know if he wanted me to break out my whip or what it was I'm going to get more money out of them than what they say they can pay, but um, I'd like to have suggestions. He didn't give me any. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've read the Ferguson Report. I've read parts the of The Ferguson it, no, Report no. is what prompted this review, and that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Uh, but I didn't need this review to review what we do, because since I've gotten here, how we go about collecting, we constantly review, because it is a very fine line you must walk. You can't have a debtor's court, and... There are courts being sued because of some of the uh, processes that they follow uh, that are illegal. Uh, there was a recent suit out in Dodge City. I've seen the lawsuit in Wichita. I've seen the lawsuit in Overland Park. I've read the Ferguson report. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the court is not to raise revenue, okay? A lot of people think it is. A lot of defendants think it is, okay? We don't write the laws, we don't write the tickets, we administer justice. And when someone is found guilty, the way we administer justice on a guilty person is we penalize them. That's what we do. We have two ways to penalize them. One's with a fine, one's with jail time. Mm -hmm. People that don't fit, uh, pay fines will learn that they will then get jail time. But I can't say... I'm going to fine you $70, and if you don't pay it, I'm going to put you in jail. That's a debtor's court. Uh, I can't... In Ferguson, one of the things they were doing is that when people didn't pay, they would summon them back to court, and if they didn't show up... And this is just on the payment issue, and when they didn't show up, they would charge them with a new offense, a new crime mm -hmm. for, for not coming back. Uh, they did a number of things. I, I've read the Ferguson report like I've read these lawsuits because I want to make sure we don't cross the line that other people may cross and I didn't need this report to tell me I'm glad this report doesn't say anything in there that is reminiscent of Ferguson but that's no surprise to me because we're familiar with that and we don't do those things that other courts have gotten in trouble for that's not to mean we don't expect you to pay and that's the difference. When you get a fine, it's not words out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. It's a meaningful punishment. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay and, and you aren't expected to pay, that's not punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when people are given a fine as punishment, they are expected to pay. And when they don't pay, we will make all efforts legally to collect what they owe. And that's what, was, that's what I inherited, is that I inherited a uh, culture of people getting fines but no efforts, no meaningful efforts being made to collect. Mm -hmm. And so they got spoiled and they just, what happens is they continue to commit offenses with impunity. Right. And so my direction when I was hired, and I think it came from the city council to the city manager and to me when I was hired, improved collections and we've done that. 